Um, and I'm much worse than skim reading. I haven't even read it. <laughs> Just heard you. And what I heard, I agreed with almost everything, but I felt the macro was really missing. And you can look at particular panels and see what they do. And what they're going to do is going to be very different according to what that economy is doing. So in China, education's been fantastic because at the same time they're doing the infrastructure and this and that and generating the jobs. Uh, in Ethiopia, it probably is not going to get you very far because the other side of the picture isn't there. So I think we do have to look at the other side of the picture more than has been done here. The, the only, uh, or maybe has been done, but you know, in your <coughs> presentation, it wasn't apparent. And the other thing I wanted to say, which um, in a way reflects, uh, agrees with uh, what Duncan said, is that I think you have to take a more multidimensional view of poverty. It, to me, it means nothing to say we're going to eliminate monetary poverty. People may still be malnourished. We know a lot of them you know, are. People may still be lacking education, they may have no housing, and they've got their dollar twenty-five a day, and it just doesn't mean anything. So I would like you to be much more multidimensional and to be more specific and include the disabled in particular, who are going to be the rump of the chronic poor even after 2015. Thanks, Francis. Would you like to just help us deconstruct Santosh's reply to my question about the Francis Stewart conundrum, which seemed to be we've done lots of growth and it's been of direct benefit to the poor because it's been rural infrastructure and construction? Well, what I would understood as my conundrum were our <laughs> findings, our research findings were that if you go for growth but you neglect human development, that growth is not sustainable. So you have to invest in human development, in education and health at the same time as the things that contribute to growth. So a sequencing which says growth first and then human development doesn't work. Uh, that is I guess what I understood by my conundrum. And, and <laughs> did you think India had achieved that from what you heard? Well, I think India's beginning to achieve it, and China definitely has. I mean, India's beginning to invest in the human side, probably not enough, and also doing the other side. Okay. We might hear some other views on that. Thanks so much. There's somebody behind you, I think, with a hand up. Is there? Yeah. Um, Will you stand up, say who you are? Yes. Host uh, Manuel Roche from uh, Save the Children. Um, and I, I, I want to emphasize on. I think on, on Francis's point on multidimensional. And my question is the following. What I, what I see, and I enjoy very much to see the, the dynamics. And in the dynamics, I think what you are precisely emphasizing is how these different aspects, if someone gets ill, falls into an effect, then an education effect. So I think this very much, even if you are not necessarily, you are focusing on dollar a day. There's something there that is very multi interaction between these dimensions. And that, what, what I wonder then is whether, because then you are only looking at the dollar a day or other measure that is monetary, and people are both uh, aligned. So whether the line is straight, sharp, is one question. So people go out or in, but actually just being slightly above doesn't really make you non-poor. That's one aspect. The other one is measuring is really complicated because sometimes you have consumptions there, you have, Sometimes you don't have really the investment that is being put in education or health is actually not measured in the in the dollar a day or in the or in the, the panels that you have. So there's something there that is quite complicated on getting into it. And so I just wonder whether getting into the dynamic that you are analyzing, the panels, it'd be worth looking at well being and mobility in some way. And I think I perhaps I disagree a little bit with, with Duncan there that if, if there's not a clear cut, and we are looking at the different dimension of how they interact, then why don't we look at social mobility in some way? And so the individual or the household, might they don't have education at the point, but did the parents have education, and what's happening with the rest behind and above? And then how is that this dynamic interact? And then I think you r clearly what, what are the dimensions that if, those, if there are chocks on those, then that cut's actually moving Okay. We'll be, we'll be um, I'm going to take a couple more and then try and structure a conversation. Let's go over this side and then we'll come back to you in a second. Donald Curtis, uh, Honorary Fellow at Birmingham. Um, my uh, comment come question is concerns uh, social capital, what my neighbour just called uh, social capital. I was calling about um, social resources, uh, which don't feature at all, namely uh, what do people do for each other and under what circumstances do they do that? And is, in some senses, uh, market extension and exposure 
a negative factor in relation to social resources. Um, a, a load of questions here, complicated questions, but it's not all about what state does, but what other people do as well. That's a good point. Thank you very much. Uh, over here. Joe Hanlon, Open University and LSC. Very bravely like to disagree with Francis. Which <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that is true for both Europe and Africa at the moment is an educated generation that can't get jobs. And if you look at Africa and the countries that I work in, you have a huge cohort of people who have, because of the big push in education over the last 10 or 15 years, who come out of school, say they're educated, have no employment, are told, well, create your own jobs. And they create their own jobs by selling things on the streets of the cities that I go to. And it seems to me that we've, what we've ended up with now is a backlash against education, in which people say, well, it's not worth going to school because it doesn't give me a job. And I think the economic growth side now is, much more, is more important than the human development side because we have to respond to the investment that we've already been making in human development to try to get jobs for the people who are coming out of school. Okay, thank you. Um, let me try and identify three topics that I'd like us to kind of push out a bit, Andrew, and you may have yeah. some others, Kiara, okay. you want to bring in. The first is, what exactly is chronic poverty? And, and, and we're told chronic poverty, chronic poverty, chronic poverty, but there has been some questioning about how you, how, how you define the topic. And in a way, you defined it as being synonymous with poverty in your introduction, which is slightly different to the way you described it in the very first chronic poverty report. And I'm just curious to know how you've evolved in your thinking. Um, and that links up to the multidimensionality issue and whether it's valuable to try and bring everything into one single aggregate indicator. Um, the second is to ask you to say a bit more about the dynamics and transitions in and out, the value of panel surveys in capturing that. Santosh's point that often panel surveys are very small samples and don't reflect uh, reality, and whether or not you've highlighted that sufficiently in the overall concept. And then the third is a set of questions we've had about what's in the policy package. Is it macro enough? Have you dealt with conflict? Is education a dead end? Uh, what about social resources and some other things? And you may have some other issues you want to shoehorn into that, but let's, let's try and start out with the question of what is chronic poverty? and what are we really worried about, and then see whether, after you've replied, anybody wants to come back to you, and then we'll deal with the others. Okay. Um, <coughs> shall I go first? Can yeah, I, yeah, I think, yeah? I think right. yeah, you go with the Is there any particular bits you want to No, no, take? later, Maybe yes, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, what is chronic poverty, and have we strayed? Yes, we have strayed, and we strayed quite deliberately on this occasion because of the getting to zero theme, and we felt that the work that had gone into exploring chronic poverty could actually usefully be extended to that broader issue. Have we lost the focus on chronic poverty? I hope not. I mean, I think half the presentation was on chronic poverty. You'll find more in the report on chronic poverty than on the other two legs of the, the tripod. Um, but if, if the theme is getting to zero, and I think you know, there will be a certain extent to which that international preoccupation will also get reflected in at least some countries' preoccupation, then I think looking at it in the round is, is pretty important. <coughs> um, and what is chronic poverty? I think we've, we've stuck with um, the same definition, and it is a monetary definition. And coming on to the question about the relationship with more multidimensional approaches to the understanding of poverty. Um, I think what we have uh, tried to do is to look at, I think this is what you were getting at, Jose, uh, we have tried to look at the relationships between these different dimensions. So we are looking at, um, if you take impoverishment, impoverishment as a process which has different dimensions. We are, taking, we are looking at the, out, the, the outcome in terms of a monetary value, but we are taking into account the different dimensions in analysing the process. And I think those different dimensions are then reflected into the policy conclusions, recommendations and so on that we, that we attempt to make. So, um, I mean, I think 
I think there is a, another discussion to be had about uh, about the uh, about the the relative value of multi-dimensional uh, indicators versus uh, unidimensional indicators. I'm not a terribly good person to have that discussion with, I guess, but um, uh, that's what we've tried to do anyway. So I think I think in overall conceptual terms, you have got many dimensions in the picture, and of course, uh, when you begin to rely on qualitative data which we have done as much as we can, um, you know, that very much comes through the different dimensions. If I, mean, you did I, do, if you did I do have a personal yeah. sort of thing which says that indices are not always very useful because you're combining many different things and you can be obscuring what is going on uh, in the index by using an index. So I wouldn't want to rely on an index alone. I would want to separate out the different dimensions and look at the relationships between them. If we had a Venn diagram which yeah. had one of your measures on in one circle and one of your measures, one of the Oxford measures in another circle, Francis makes the point that there wouldn't necessarily be a large overlap between them. Well I think if you if you take uh, the the Oxford um, uh, main multidimensional poverty index, uh, you have a very large, just thinking of numbers of people, it's a very, very large number of people, far more people than are chronically poor. But if you take your severe multidimensional poverty index, I suspect that there may be a greater overlap. However, we have got a graph, which was prepared by Katerina, <laughs> which demonstrates that as far as we can see, there is not much relationship between all these different indicators. You know, take severe monetary poverty, chronic poverty, uh, severe multidimensional, your normal multidimensional, there really isn't much relationship at a country level. So in terms of numbers of people that are being counted there. So I think with all these different measures of poverty, we risk generating a certain amount of confusion as well. So I think this is maybe a debate which needs to carry on, but and I'll certainly share that graph with you. And <laughs> also, yes, sorry, Canada. just sorry, to yeah. add on this point, I think that the multidimensionality here in the report comes from the policies. I mean, yes, we identify chronic poverty in terms of monetary poverty, but then we bring in the m all the dimensions in terms of the policies. And I suspect that we probably agree in terms of the policies than then yeah. are necessary, which is but probably uh, what matters. But logically, your policy might lead you to stop investing in a policy if it wasn't delivering one of these things, whereas over there they would be investing in it because it was attacking a different objective. But let's just hang on a minute, because some you wanted to come in on this topic, and, and you... Uh, um, my name's Paul Dornan. Can you stand up and say who you are and take a mic? Sorry, because you're being streamed. Uh, um, Paul Dornan, University of Oxford and Young Lives. Young Lives is a birth cohort study, uh, so also have panel uh, elements, and so very interesting to see it. Uh, just on this specific um, point, I mean, in terms of the multidimensionality, I mean, clearly there's an issue about indexing, but we don't necessarily need to think about an indexing. There's also looking at, you can look at unidimensional um, measures as well, and there, I mean, for example, if you look at, we have two cohorts, um, how much has stunting fallen um, for children? Very, very important for human development. If you're trying to unpick some of these issues about the sequencing, the linkages between different aspects, you could index, but you don't have to index. There are other ways of thinking about chronic poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Gentleman in front of you, and then we'll just let Duncan say something and then move on. Yeah, my name is Flem Bob. I'm from Slamco. Right, um, my question is, right, at the moment, right, I mean, if you look right across the, the world, right, there are countries where the economy is growing. The economy, I mean, the GDP per growth, right, is growing. When you tend to spread it to the population, it's falling. And in most countries where the GDP is growing, right, there is, I mean, a wide inequalities leading to poverty. So, in a sense, when you're talking about the multidimensional aspect of measuring poverty, you want to take into consideration as well, right? Um, but when you the, 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 unit, the unit measurement you're using is based on earning, right? It's based on earning, the average earning per, I mean, employee, right? Not necessarily GDP per person. So, I mean, how, for instance, do you compromise the two? Yeah, that's good. I think that's a fair point, and we'll come back to inequality in a second. Uh, Duncan, quickly. Yeah, and then just a quick question following this up. I mean, yeah. the, one of the things I took from the report is that in some ways, you know, prevention is is more cost effective than cure. If you can prevent people sliding back, that might be a particularly good intervention in terms of reducing poverty numbers overall. My question to Andrew is, is that your finding? And if so, might that not detract from the focus on the really hard stuff? 
at the bottom. Um, you may have found actually a reason for a, a much more cost-effective way of dealing with the 500 million churning and not the chronically poor. Okay, we're going to come to churning. Let's then move on. Uh, I just wanted to just observe as we leave this that we have to be really careful about the terms we're all using. Mm -hmm. You know, poverty, fine. Uh, you've, got a very different, you've got a different definition of extreme poverty, severe poverty and chronic poverty. Um, and that's fine on the chart. I just observed that in the report there's a certain amount of, or in our discussion, elision between extreme poverty and chronic poverty. I mean, quite often we're actually talking about extreme poverty, but we're using the phrase chronic poverty. And certainly from your very original work, that definition, that poverty that persists, you described originally as a very special problem. And I can see that it's one leg of your tripod, but I just think we all need to be a bit careful in how we use these different terms. Let's talk about churning and, and, and this issue about inequality and uh, uh, whether or not, as Duncan says, you lose focus by focusing on the very poorest by talking about people who descend back into poverty. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think that's a, a, a good question. I'm not sure that I've got an answer to it. I think just going back to the issue that um, Santosh raised about panels, the panel in India um, that we've got in the graph was a very large panel, uh, a very large survey sample, um, but it was for a previous period. And I think the thing you have to look at when you're comparing one set of figures with another is what period do they cover and what population do they cover, and so on and so forth. And y you have to do it quite carefully. Um, and I'm sure that if there were panel data for the period that Santosh was talking about, which there aren't, uh, regrettably, as yet, for India, although there will be, uh, because there's a follow-up to that survey, which will be available in a year or something, um, you know, it would probably show a very different picture to the one that we have in, in our graph. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, you can have, uh, you can have different sorts of data which bring you to different conclusions, which draw out different points about reality, and they can actually be they can appear to be contradictory, but they're not necessarily. I think looking carefully is, is important. Um, the churning point, yes, of course, people do, you know, especially if you're perhaps very close to the poverty line and, you know, you, you have a modicum but not a fantastic array of assets to project, to propel you forwards, um, there will be churning. And I think it's always a question as to how much panel surveys are capturing that churning and how much they're capturing longer term movements. And I think the more three and four wave panels that you have, in other words, the more that countries invest in such data, um, the surer you will be that you're not just capturing churning, you'll be capturing longer term movements, I think. Um, so I think, I think it's partly a question of investing in, in the data more consistently um, to, to actually capture the longer term movements. Um, um, inequality, while we're on this topic? Okay, well, inequality, I mean, we had a discussion before with, with Jose, um, and we've had other discussions along the way. Um, the report does say that uh, if an inequality goal, uh, that is, that is, well, an inequality goal would probably focus at least some of the time on, on income. Uh, if an inequality goal was adopted, that would go a long way towards promoting this agenda in the post-2015 framework. S but um, the inequalities that we focus on in the report are those inequalities that we feel um, are particularly driving of the, poverty of the dynamics that we've been looking at, and, and especially driving of chronic poverty. And those are inequality in access to education, inequality in access to land, and the third one I'm forgetting. And uh, I don't think so. But um, anyway, uh, we do, uh, and gender inequality, of course, the third one. So, I mean, we do, we do draw attention to s some inequalities which, if you want to eradicate poverty, including tackling chronic poverty, um, are really critical. I think the question about how the eradication of poverty relates to um, reduction of income inequality is very complicated. Um, and I, I certainly don't have any pat answers. I think it's quite context-specific. Levels of inequality vary enormously from one country to another, um, and I think you would probably do different things about inequality if you want to eradicate poverty in different countries. So in terms of 
making recommendations, drawing conclusions, I think that's a very complicated road to go down. Um, but I think it's an interesting one. It's a very interesting one. Okay, and Chiara? Yeah. Um, okay, so going back to this point, um, and in particular starting from Duncan's point uh, on the excessive focus on chronic poverty, I never thought about the, the three legs in this way. I actually think that thinking about poverty in, in this way, in these three dynamics, uh, makes quite clear that el eliminating poverty is a very difficult thing to do. It's uh, something that requires a very broad political and economic process and that, um, and on the contrary, only focusing on chronic poverty, so only targeting the old woman, may give the impression that, okay, let's just give her uh, some cash and let's bring her up to the poverty line and that the job is done. And we are actually trying to say, no, that's in no way uh, what is needed. And so maybe we don't spell out this need of multidimensionality, but it's there in the way that we think of, okay, what are the causes of chronic poverty, of poverty in general, and what we need uh, to do. There are a number of things that need to be done. And doing these things, so if you, re if you take seriously the, the three legs and really think, okay, I need to tackle chronic poverty, I need to prevent impoverishment, and prevent people in falling back into poverty, there are very good chances that you're also eliminating inequality. And that's one of the other reasons why probably this doesn't feature strongly, explicitly in the report. Because if you do all these things, if you really take them seriously, then there are very good chances that, that you will be reducing inequality. Because basically what we are saying is that you need to do <laughs> the process of development a bit more fair than what has been so far. And I think this comes out very strongly from the impoverishment, the preventing impoverishment bit. This is, I, I didn't go very much in detail in this during the presentation, and there are a number of things that we haven't mentioned. We, we talk about conflict, we talk about uh, even a little bit about financial crisis and political settlement. So we do okay. tackle a little bit the micro dimension. And what we say is that these things cause impoverishment. So you need to take into account the macro uh, process if you want to. All right, okay. we've, got a, we've got a question in on the iPad from somebody from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation uh, about data. And that links up to something that Jen said also. I mean, A, how confident are you in the data? And B, how do, how do you react to Jen's question about whether or not we're just having an overload of indicators? Um, I mean, the confidence... And we'll, I'll tell you what the answer is. <laughs> I'll send you an email. Thank you for coming, Jen. Thank you very much. <laughs> the confidence in the data is, uh, of course, again, a very nitty-gritty question and you know some data is better than others and so on but I think the surveys that we've presented particularly those that we've presented in this uh, printed document are ones which um, have got a good reputation are quite widely used uh, they're reasonably nationally representative they're either you know as nationally representative as you can get in a panel um, but in any case they're not ones where there's been massive attrition you know loss of people over um, different waves, or if there has, something decent has been done about it. So the, the quantitative data I think we're pretty confident in. There's other bits of quantitative data that are used through the report which where we're perhaps slightly less, so we haven't uh, brought it up uh, into the headlines, if you like. But, um, you know, we're as confident, I'm not a technical person on this, but we're as confident uh, as I think we need to be in order to draw the kinds of conclusions that we have. Um, the qualitative data uh, has, again, it varies in quality from uh, case to case, but um, it's, been, uh, it's been researched very carefully, so um, I'd be reasonably confident um, in that, more from some countries than others. Um, too many indicators. Uh, yes, okay, there is a raft of indicators in the report suggested. Uh, the post-2015 discussion is at a very early stage in working out indicators. I mean, clearly, first, you've got to talk about your goals and your targets. Um, and uh, there are too many being suggested. However, um, 
what we what we've done there is really to make the case for panel data for a massive investment in panel data around the pe around the period of 2015 so that countries begin to establish a baseline of the extent to which people are being impoverished or escaping poverty and can then monitor that over over the subsequent years that's the case yeah. that we're trying okay. to make and the goal which only has three elements in it is yeah. quite a good balance. Yeah. okay i want to move on because we've got 20 minutes we want to talk, about, talk policy, about policy, policy. Yes, please. Uh, mm. and uh, you've had some challenges on conflict on education on social capital on the macro and actually just to add one santos said something very interesting which is land actually the people who get rid of the land and go and work in town are doing better than those who stay which is a bit of a challenge to some of your early graphs about losing land. Yeah. So three or four things there for you to pick up on, and then we'll open it up again. Okay, well, I'll take two or three of them, and then maybe, Chiara, you can also come in. Um, on land, uh, I mean, this is, this is a... I've been surprised, to be honest, that the research has produced uh, the need to accumulate land as part of the story of escaping poverty sustainably uh, to the extent that it has. So, I mean, obviously this is, uh, you know, contextually specific to some extent, and, um, you know, India, if you compare India with uh, many African countries, land is still much more available uh, in Africa, there's much less pressure than there is in India. So, there are going to be context specificities, but even in India, in fact, especially in India, the ability to accumulate land, the ability to farm more land this year than five years ago, comes out very consistently in stories of escaping poverty. It's not the only thing that's happening. And, you know, for example, in Tanzania, we, we thought that uh, accumulating land was important, but uh, diversifying occupations was what actually triggered escaping poverty and was more likely to kind of keep you out of poverty in, in future. And that was really from the qualitative... But this is when you're talking to people in rural areas, not to yeah. people who've migrated. Um, the, yeah. the media, in fact, lost more land. Yeah, than they <laughs> that's what we saw. Is saying. The media lost more land. Um, you know, my worry is that that graph has actually been, the bars have been reversed. <laughs> um, and also, what's the? I, I <laughs> think our truths think, were established. I think we need to take a serious look at that graph. Actually, again. <laughs> okay, but let's leave the graph at the point that if you only interview because people who stay in rural areas yeah. who are dependent yes, on okay. land, you'll get mm. one answer. If you ask the people who are now software millionaires in Bangalore who've sold their land to do it, the, then classic, the classic thing in India is that the oldest son, usually, uh, stays and looks after the farm. The second son migrates, gets an education and migrates. And the second sons, there's a lot of evidence now saying that the second sons are doing better than the older sons. And the older sons are resenting this. So, yes, yeah, okay. in, in that context. I mean, I think mig out-migration, the non-farm economy, incredibly important in terms of the tipping points uh, and, and getting out of poverty. But it's, it's not an either-or story, I think, is the, the, the picture that we're trying to create. It's, it's combined and intertwined. Um, on social resources, I think there's quite a lot of evidence uh, from uh, you know, the, the, the research that many people have done that chronically poor people are not very well placed in terms of social resources. Uh, they don't have the networks, and certainly their networks are generally with other people who are equally poorly resourced. Um, so social resources are a bit limited um, in terms of either preventing further impoverishment or, uh, you know, the, the, their connections um, up in, uh, upwards in, the, um, in society are not, are not that great. Uh, and they tend to get excluded from formally organised uh, local... Um, local uh, organisations and so on. Um, another issue is that these social resources, there are considerable constraints when uh, crises uh, happen, particularly if, if uh, the crises are systemic and involve lots of people in a particular community. If, if all your network is experiencing the same sort of uh, shock, then you've got a problem. Your network isn't going to be terribly helpful. So yes, I mean, social resources is important, but I think uh, with limits and constraints uh, in, in terms of these achieving these three objectives. But would you advise investing in social capital? Is this kind of the corollary? To a person or...? 
What, what do you mean? To a government supporting? I mean, if, if the choice is between, uh, you know, this is the old World Bank uh, debate. Let's not invest in social protection because we don't want to destroy social capital. And this is just nonsense. No. But when I social protection will actually enhance social capital. When I used to teach rural development, we used to say 1950 is the era of community development, which yes, is kind well, of, you know, in, in among other things, building social capital. Should we encourage the poor to it join worked well, It worked you know? well for the rich, yeah, I think, right, okay. and for the, perhaps for the moderately poor. I, I, I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm not... I mean, I think there are lots... You know, one, one shouldn't... We've had lots of discussions about this. <laughs> Um, right. So perhaps I'm being a bit stentorian. We might come back to it. But yeah, you can, can come keep back going to it. on some other On things. the macro issue, um, yes, clearly the, the macro context is absolutely critical, um, and we didn't dwell on it that much in the in the presentation. Um, I mean, we do we do say very clearly that uh, you, there are these three policies which will work sets of policies which will work for you pretty universally in terms of getting closer to zero. Everything else is context specific, and clearly, you know, uh, economic growth, um, population growth, politics. I mean, there are major aspects of the context which are going to determine uh, your choice of other other policies, if you like. So, growth certainly is is very very important. Clara, um, not so much to add. So apart from the fact that we use a lot the concept of. Uh, pro poor political settlement in the report, and we try to figure out what is a pro poor political settlement and what, how do you get there? And we struggled a, li a bit to get to an answer, so I don't think we have a definitive answer. But some of the things that we we mention and try to reflect a little bit is the need of collective action, which is perhaps another way to get to the. Uh, social capital bit, which I, I rather call it collective action rather than social capital. Um, but um, so that's one of the things that that you need to do is um, trying to promote collective action among the poor. Then how you do that and what exactly uh, that is, we don't go very much in detail. But the the idea is, I think we link it to what we call transformative social change. So trigger changes um, at, at the community level in uh, cultural um, and social norm practices, if you want. And, and the other thing that, um, for instance, we use the pro poor political settlement uh, notion to say something about conflict so and fragile state and how you go from fragile state uh, to resilience, and again, we we try to identify what are the factors, what are the characteristics that lead um, um, fragile state to become resilient, and we find that this, um, the, the, the characteristic, the factors that allow these are pretty much the same uh, of what we like to call a proper political settlement. So, uh, for instance, good uh, intermediate governance characteristics. There is, there are some, there must be some areas of uh, good practice in the public administration, for instance, and that can be the area where you start uh, implementing reforms or, or changing things. Um, can I just, just, just yeah, I'm, of I'm, course. I'm, I'm, I'm just challenging you on some of these things so that we really get the story clear. If you look at this, this graph, this, this, this map that you showed in figure eight in the report, and you look at all the countries in red, which are your high risk countries. I mean, half of these have UN peacekeeping forces or EU peacekeeping forces, yeah. or if they don't have massive genocide going yeah. on, you know, and it kind of frightens the life out of you to look at those red yes, countries. And, and, you know, there's uh, the uh, importance uh, of fragile states. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I suppose the question is, if we're going to talk about chronic poverty in the way Duncan encourages us to, do we need a really much stronger message than a pro-poor political settlement, which is the kind of thing you might talk to your auntie about over tea, you know, in the vicarage, rather than we are going to have to have some serious action and strengthen the ICC and deal with uh, peacekeeping in a new way. I mean, I'm, I'm asking because I'd like to know the answer. I mean, I would say that um, preventing conflict uh, and, um, and resolving conflict in a permanent way is something which the world does not do well. And it doesn't do it well uh, at a global level, it doesn't do it particularly well at a regional level. Uh, it needs a lot more investment. Mm. I guess it's a fairly new art. 
Um, I'm looking at Frances here because yeah. she has worked so much on these on these issues. I was going to look at Frances as well, but uh, does anybody else want to come in on this? So somebody, uh, Sri Lanka, I know is going to come up, no, uh, isn't it? Is. All right, but be brief. about it but I won't <laughs> right the complexity of this world has been increasing exponentially have we been changing our methods of tackling the problems no I want to mention one thing uh, uh, I leave the uh, you to answer the question uh, what about the poverty that is being created by oppressive regimes poverty is being created today I will have to tell this as an example. Today, there was a protest, a huge protest in front of uh, Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission by people whose land has been grabbed over the last uh, several years uh, by Sri Lankan government for World um, Bank funded project for tourism, to promote tourism. This promotion is uh, too much in some cases. We have to look at the way we promote tourism because it is depriving, oppressing the people, the oppressed people, it is oppressing the oppressed people in some countries. It is the, the rich people in those countries are grabbing the land of the poor people to build uh, uh, for luxurious resorts for tourists. Okay, very good. Francis, you want to come in on this? And, and then somebody behind you? Yeah. It's a huge topic, I can't uh, summarise it, but one thing I would say is that conflict is definitely coming down if you look at the data. Sure. Mm -hmm. So when you say the world doesn't do it very well, I think something is happening which is good. There's a definite decline. And I think we are beginning to know the sort of features of a sustainable settlement, which is sharing things, sharing power above all among yeah. different groups but also sharing economic resources. Mm. Now, at least we've identified that. Now, that is completely inconsistent with our normal models. It's inconsistent with a majoritarian democracy. Mm -hmm. It's inconsistent with the market system. You need to put in all sorts of constraints on both. And the question is how we get the sort of political will for the constraints. But I do think we have made progress in that Okay, respect. thank you. There's one next to you, one behind you, and this gentleman at the front. Uh, but briefly, because we are running out of time. Yeah, I will be. Um, my name's Nova Freshville, and I work for uh, CAFOD on Post 2015, so Duncan can shoot me down later. <laughs> um, but CAFOD did a piece of participatory research in four countries, and what we found um, on the compass, um, on the conflict issue is that it's one of the issues, both at the local and national context, that can undermine decades' worth of kind of hard work yeah. and slow-won gains. But one thing that I really wanted to raise, and I don't think has been addressed very much in the report or the discussion here today, is that although in the post-2015 everyone talks about poverty eradication and getting to zero, very little is said about what the specific challenges and ob obstacles that face the chronically poor are. So I'd actually agree with Duncan that that focus needs to be included. And one of the things that we found through our research is that discrimination and social inclusion are not being addressed and not being tackled. So unless that's front and centre, we won't be making the progress that we want. Very good, thanks very much. Yes, please. Uh, Tim Wainwright from uh, Ad Action on Disability Development. First of all, actually, just to say how uh, delightful it is to attend a meeting like this and not be the only person that mentions disability, which has happened to me on many occasions. So thank you to uh, Andrew and his team and also a number of you who've raised the issue already. Um, I, I've actually got something that's been going through my mind over the last hour and a half or so, which is sort of troubling me a bit, which is about the... Um, uh, well, I suppose what I observe is a lot of what we're talking about is either at the country level, very, very macro, or, or even higher than that, or at the individual level. We're looking at graphs of individuals. And, and, and in, in my work, uh, which focuses on disabled people, what I observe is actually an awful lot of what's going on is uh, nothing to do with the individual, nothing to do with the uh, country. It's to do with principally the household and to some extent the wider community and local institutions. Um, there are about a billion disabled uh, people in the world, so that's about one in seven of us. Um, so it doesn't take a genius to work out that there's an awful lot of households that will contain uh, at least one person who would be uh, disabled, whether they identified as disabled or not is, is a second question. And a lot of, uh, in our work, a lot of what we see are the, the interrelationships between these two. So I'm thinking about a little bit about what you said earlier, Duncan, about the the uh, disabled grandmother living in rural mm. somewhere. Um, 
but also, if you think about a disabled child, who, who will take that child to school? Uh, and if they take the child to school, what happens to household income? So I think there's a load of interrelationships here. Um, and just to say, Duncan, I met a disabled uh, grandmother in Tanzania who'd actually been responsible. She was disabled in her 20s, and she'd been responsible for raising most of her extended family. Um, her kids, most of them had died of AIDS, so she was making sure that her grandchildren go to school. So okay. some it, sometimes it's an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Joshua, we've got seven minutes. Yes. I want to take this gentleman here. I want to give Duncan a last word and give you the very last word, except yeah. that I want to say something at the end yeah, um, uh, and say thank you. <laughs> so very briefly. Yeah, briefly, exactly. Um, thank you um, for making me ask a second question. Um, uh, this gentleman, you made mention of three policies, which I think one of the most important missing bits in your three policies is finance. You made mention of, I mean, politics. You made mention of, I mean, economics and population. But dear me, you left finance, which is extremely, extremely important. And if I'm not mistaken, probably it's one of the most important policy, right, among the three bits you made mention of, which is important, right, in the economic allocation of the various economic activities to eradicate poverty. Okay, thanks so much. Duncan, last word. Um, I'm going to have to go and read it properly now. So that's been, that's <laughs> been uh, you've just absorbed another few hours of my life. Thank you for that. Um, I sense an underlying tension between uh, the desire to do justice to politics, power, norms, culture on the one hand, which is such an important part of creating and perpetuating chronic poverty, and the desire to find policy solutions which are neat and sellable on the other, many of which will be in the sort of economic policy growth area. And I'm interested in whether that is a tension or just reality. Um, it would be great if the next chronic poverty report, assuming there is another one, uh, focused on culture and power in politics uh, and didn't talk about post-2015. Mm, very good. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got five minutes. If you take a couple of minutes each, just to... And, yep. and as you do that, would you just pick up Joe Hanlon's point about, about education, which I think you need to answer. What was your Pe point, Joe? Pe people don't care about oh, education. They, they can't get jobs. They can't so get jobs. The, the, the oh, well, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot in the report about pro poorest growth. So we don't talk very much because we're not experts in what generates growth per se, but we, we have tried to weave a story about how the poorest people can participate in benefit from growth. Uh, and clearly, if that isn't happening at all, the incentives to go to school and to stay in school will be very small. So it is interlinked, uh, obviously. And you know, I think that's... That's part of the reason that pro poorest growth and education are two of the three policies which are going to work across the three objectives that, that we say are, are necessary. Um, p the point about uh, discrimination not being tackled. When in a slightly earlier formulation of the goal and the targets that we were proposing, discrimi combating discrimination was absolutely at the center of tackling chronic poverty. And somehow, along the way, it's got a little bit, uh, I don't know, made more technical. Um, I'm not quite sure why I have to look back at that. But I think it's, it needs to be at the heart of it. And there are certainly groups within the UN uh, system that would like to see discrimination represented somehow in the post-2015 framework. So, uh, And the report that will be um, launching at a later stage on addressing intersecting inequalities will propose a target on uh, discrimination. Um, you know, what difference that will make, I'm not, I'm not quite sure in the way that these things work. But anyway, that's for what it's worth. The finance point, I think, is a very serious point. There is a chapter in the report on finance. Uh, it doesn't try to cost uh, getting to zero or getting towards zero, but there are people around who are trying to do that. What it does do, it was contributed by development initiatives and it was um, based largely on the work that they did for their big report on development finance uh, last year. Was it last year, Tony? 2013, yeah. Um, what it does do is point out that there are, I think it's over 500 million people, 540 million people, if I remember rightly, living in 44 countries which spend per capita total public expenditure, including elements of aid, less than $500. And quite a lot of those countries are spending $200, $300 per capita. That is a long way from what is required to get to zero. And we don't know what is required to get to zero, but I think we can safely say that that is a very long way. 
And the report makes a very strong case for uh, improving on domestic resource mobilization, so in increasing the tax take, increasing the efficiency of taxation, preferably increasing the equity of uh, taxation, but particularly the efficiency of taxation. Um, and also it, make, it makes a very strong case for the need for continued aid, probably not just for those 44 countries. Um, many of those 44 countries, if you project their expenditure forwards 15 years, you find they're still spending under 500 or likely to be spending under $500 uh, per capita per year. So, I mean, finance is very much in there. Finance is a precondition for all the policies that we've been talking about, and I'm sorry we didn't mention it. Chiara, 30 seconds, uh, 45 yeah, seconds. Yeah, just to say that I totally agree that the mass level is the way to go to understand yeah. where change has to take place, and I hope that we can focus on that Very good. <laughs> in the future. For future okay, yeah. uh, just before I say thank you, Duncan made a really important point at the beginning, which is the importance of having clear, unambiguous messages for people working on the big global frameworks, whether it's post-2015 or something else. And I think what this does is help us to do it. The, the very clear emphasis on dynamics, the really important tripod, <coughs> the very clear kind of construction of a policy framework that, that helps us to deal with that tripod is, I think, a real contribution. And if we can carry it forward in terms of goals and targets, that will also be extremely useful. So in ODI, we have detailed and technical discussions about the content, and we use those in order to make clear uh, proposals to policymakers. I think you've helped us to do both of those. I'm really grateful to all those who've contributed, including online. And thank you very much for coming. And please join me in thanking both the discussants and the speakers. Thank you very much.